This is Rod Stallmuller and this is Tech Talk Tuesday. We've got a great program for you this morning. Uh, we're going to be talking about reference architectures for single cloud enterprises. You hear us talking about multi-cloud network architectures all the time, but it is very important and we see all of our customers start in a single cloud before they move to multi-cloud. Today we've got two of our top guys uh, people who, who talk to our customers every day, they're helping large and small enterprises in their move to cloud and have lots and lots of experience. Saad Mirza and Noman Mustafa will be talking with you today. We also have uh, Brian Ashley who will be manning the Q&A uh, panel. So if you have questions during the session, please ask your questions through the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. Um, as opposed to using the chat. That way we can answer your questions as we go along. And we'll cover some questions uh, that were asked at the end of the presentation. So again, great program for you today. Uh, I'll turn it over to Noman. Thanks, Rod. <clears throat> um, so today's session is about uh, an architect view of uh, building cloud networking security uh, in an enterprise. So let's first look at uh, what kind of uh, cloud customers are we seeing, right? So uh, as we all know that uh, Cambrian explosion of cloud started about 18 months ago, right? A lot of people, they were talking about cloud five, six years ago, but uh, what we see in our experience is uh, about 18 months ago, right? Is when actually inter enterprise started moving into public clouds. And <clears throat> there could be different variation of uh, businesses, right? Some people are actually born in the cloud. So we call them born in the cloud customers. Uh, some of the enterprises, uh, big enterprises, what we are seeing is they're moving to public cloud aggressively to a point where they are even shutting down their data centers. And we work with those customers pretty much every week. And there are other customers who are aggressively moving into public cloud, but they want to keep their on-prem for a while because maybe their applications are not ready. Their operational discipline may not be there. Uh, but one thing is common, right? That, that most of the businesses are now looking to move into public cloud and COVID has just accelerated that uh, move to uh, public cloud. It could be a journey that starts with one cloud, right? So maybe, you know, you, your customer may be really comfortable with uh, the cloud provider. AWS has done a remarkable job in terms of ensuring that the model works, right? So earlier things were getting moved around as special projects and things were being done on the side, but now it has become an enterprise IT strategy where people are moving into one cloud. So you may be a customer who may be very comfortable with your cloud, cloud provider. We are seeing AWS and Azure is pretty much the dominant cloud providers today. But we also have customers who wants to make sure that they are able to extend to a second cloud, right? And, and we see that uh, it may not be the case that you may have equal distribution of workloads across uh, two clouds, but extending to a cloud to consume the service that they may be better at providing is very critical, right? So no matter um, where you start your journey, it's important that you have a reference architecture in place. So today talk is about, you know, do I need a reference architecture if I have multi multiple cloud uh, or in a single cloud? Now, what we have learned from our experience working with cloud is when you start your journey, right? The first thing that you uh, learn or, or you, you get uh, um, understanding of is that a uh, cloud provider will provide you everything and anything that you need, compute, storage, networking, and security, right? But do they provide you all of those capabilities at the enterprise grade level is a question mark. And what we see is, you know, CSP will provide you the basic primitive constructs, but they're not at the enterprise scale, right? Their focus is all about providing you services and consumption models, right? So they will have provide you the data warehousing services, AI and machine learning services, web app services, Kubernetes type services. And this is where I think they want uh, to be able to focus on and then they want to expand and add consumption, right? So you can have more compute capacity. But the focus on networking and security is not there. And what we see is the, the constructs that they provide are very, very primitive in nature, right? It requires a lot of manual work and the go build complexity is real, right? You may uh, go down the path of building Terraforms and leveraging Lambda scripts and building you know, layers after layers, it just makes operational complexity even more, right? And the biggest thing about uh, what we see in custom environments is the operational visibility is not there and it severely lacks troubleshooting skills, 
Now, in terms of uh, what we see today is, you know, the mission critical applications are now moving to public cloud and businesses are requiring or asking their enterprise IT to take control and make sure they're able to provide SLA. And this is one thing that, you know, uh, we, we recommend that uh, in terms of providing security and SLAs, it's a shared responsibility. And right? you can't really basically put your applications and then put everything to a cloud provider that now you're responsible for providing the SLA that you need as a business. It's a shared responsibility. So understanding where a cloud provider <clears throat> has strengths, where they are <clears throat> uh, have weaknesses and be able to address those uh, weaknesses to make sure that you provide your business, the enterprise grade architecture is very critical. And today what we see is <clears throat> um, no cloud provider will basically uh, provide you recommendations to an architecture, architecture that's repeatable because it's sort of, they like to do a, <clears throat> um, to, to sort of uh, prescribe cloud lock-in where, you know, once you're locked in, you can't really move out to the other cloud provider, but this is not uh, what normally the reference architecture uh, prescribes. Now, one of the things that we also see is <clears throat> the lack of architecture skills and maturity in public cloud would result into slow cloud adoption and it will in over time increase your operational complexity so this is very very critical that when you are starting your journey no matter how small you are make sure that your architectural considerations are front and center it's very similar to building a house right so when you build a house you look at multiple dimensions right? you don't say that okay i found a house with six bedrooms and a beautiful interior, I'm going to buy that house, right? What if I tell you that that house is under a high tension wire? That house is in the flood zone. That house is 15 minutes away from the highway. There are no school, a good school districts close by, right? So wouldn't it change your perception about whether that's the right house to buy or not? So the key point that I'm trying to make here is whether you are in one cloud, whether you are a small, whether you are in one region or multiple region, give an architectural consideration very, very important and make it front and center of your cloud journey. Now, <clears throat> the, what we also see that since the architects or enterprise IT are not uh, skilled in uh, cloud constructs or public cloud, and there are no reference architecture available, just like in on-prem world, we used to have reference architectures that we used to follow, right? Access distribution core, leaf and spine. There's no reference architecture and what we, see is we, we architects jump into implementation details. How do I connect VPC to VPC? How do I insert or directly attach a firewall to a VPC? Right? So a lot of these things, the characteristics that we normally used to consider in public cloud in on-prem world is no longer exist. Right? So, but I think what we have to do is avoid the urge of jumping into implementation and build mindset and give your uh, characteristics of architecture uh, a, a consideration in terms of availability, in terms of manageability, in terms of performance, uh, in terms of security, right? Security again is a shared responsibility. CSP will provide you the constructs, but at the end of the day, you are the one who understands your business postures and would be able to provide the security that your enterprise needs. Now let's look at um, the reference architecture that Aviatrix has proposed to the industry. It's a very simple and pragmatic architecture and then later we will show you how our platform actually translates that architecture into a uh, implementation uh, that is a win-win. Uh, the three different pillars, one is a security pillar, the operations pillar, and the cloud networking pillar. In the cloud networking pillar, we have three layers. We're defining three layers. The first one is the application layer. Application layer is uh, where your applications, your crown jewels will reside, right? This could be a a single cloud, single region, or it could be a single cloud, you know, multiple region. And then you it obviously will have multiple accounts, which is a concept that, you know, we all have to understand. It was not there in the on-prem world, but here everything is based on accounts or subscriptions. Uh, so it's important to understand how application needs to talk to each other. What are the networking needs? What are the security needs, right? And do they, if they are in different regions, how they, are need, uh, how they need to talk to each other? What are the needs in terms of connecting to the on-prem world, right? What are the needs to connecting to internet? What are the needs to connecting uh, to a, another applications which may be sitting in a different region, right? So, and all of this needs to happen not as a snowflake or a reactive way of doing it. You need to make sure that you have a proper architectural mindset in terms of creating a repeatable architecture so that it becomes easier for you to manage. It becomes easier for your operations team to visualize 
and troubleshoot in case things go down. Then a very important aspect is inserting next generation services or new services. For example, if you have a production application that's trying to talk to the internet or talk to other uh, non-production environment, you might be able to want uh, them to uh, talk to a layer seven firewall. Right? So you want the ability to be able to insert a checkpoint firewall or a Palo Alto firewall or a uh, you know, Fortinet firewall, firewall. And all of that needs to happen in an architectural way. Right? Because when you do it in an architectural way, you don't compromise on the performance. You don't com compromise on the operational complexity. And this is something that will show how it's a critical to do it in an architectural way. Next is your branch offices would want to access to the on-prem world. Again, it needs to have a seamless experience where the users should be able to connect, your branches should be able to connect, your data centers should be able to connect and moving forward, right? A new type of stub um, locations like AWS Outposts or, or Azure Stack will come into play. So your architecture needs to look at how things going, are going to expand in the future as well. On top of this, you need to have a consistent security policy. Again, it's very critical for architects to understand what cloud provider provides and what are your business application needs because getting to know about the construct is one thing, but be able to provide or develop a security posture for your business is very critical, right? So having a consistent security policy that you can apply to different uh, pods or region is very critical. I have a customer who basically uh, commented that, you know, what my users do inside the VPCs and VNets um, is uh, something that probably I cannot control. But what I want to be able to control from a centralized IT perspective is the enforcement of compliance and governance across all of these tenant and users. So in an architecture, it's very critical that you have a repeatable, consistent security policy architecture as well. Then you want to have a common operational visibility con and control, right? If you guys have worked with uh, any CSP, you will exactly know that most of these constructs are black box. And this is very frustrating for a lot of enterprise IT architects because at one point DevOps and the businesses are asking you to manage when things go down, but at the same time, you don't have the same tools that you're familiar with to troubleshoot and do capacity planning and to make sure that your environment is optimized. So having, having an operations mindset is very important when you're defining an architecture and should, should not be an afterthought. So this is all good, uh, but I think what we now need to do is translate you know, this philosophical or this approach of cloud network architecture into something that is meaningful for your enterprise. So at SAAD, we'll take over and provide you know, how AV Tricks platform gracefully implement this uh, reference architecture into your enterprise. So do you want to take over? Sure. So Noan, if you can just uh, unshare your screen. Yep. Thank you. All right, so before I talk about like how single cloud enterprises are taking advantage of Aviatrix platform capabilities, let me talk about the Aviatrix platform components first. Right, so at the top, you'll see Aviatrix controller. Right? The Aviatrix controller sits in the management and control plane. And it talks to the Aviatrix gateways, which sits in the data plane, right? And now, it doesn't only talk to the Aviatrix gateway, but also communicates with the native constructs. So in this way, Aviatrix control plane is pretty unique. It doesn't only communicate with its own components like gateways, but it also communicate with all the other native cloud constructs. And it doesn't matter whether you are in OCI, GCP, Azure, AWS, any cloud. So th this is something very unique. The third component of uh, Aviatrix Second, so the third component of the platform is Copilot. So what Copilot provides is the dynamic topology, how everything is connected, troubleshooting, including the metadata. So now if you wanted to troubleshoot your environment, you really don't have to look through multiple pages. All the metadata is provided right in front of you at one single pane of glass. Not only that, it provides you several dashboards where you can see the spikes. Also, who's communicating with what? Who are the top talkers? All the heat maps, where if you are being attacked, where you've been attacked from, which city, all the IP address information is 
going to be available for you using the Aviatrix Copilot. All right, so now let's talk about the typical cloud journey. The typical cloud journey always starts with a single cloud, whether you have a vision to go into the multi-cloud from day one, or you will always want to remain in the single cloud, right? It doesn't matter at this point. So let's talk about this thing. So what happens, there are two different types of uh, deployments that happens in the cloud or journey that happens in the cloud. One is when a developer is going into the cloud, right? Or the other one is when the central IT is going to the cloud and providing the information like the infrastructure, also the wall gardens, the entire application platform where the developers can come in, develop the applications, and make the applications available to the rest of the world, right? So you wanted to make sure that that infrastructure is also available from on-prem too. And that's exactly what I'm showing you over here. That's all good, right? But once you get mature, then more business units comes in and then they say, hey, by the way, this is all good, but I wanted to own my own infrastructure. I wanted to take care of my applications on my own. And more importantly, there are some firewall rules, which Mr. Central IT, you have written, which are conflicting to my rules. So I want to control those firewalls as well. So for them, this is a perfect match over here. Now more and more BUs are coming in. Maybe they are coming in to the same region. If more BUs want similar kind of architecture, whether they are in the same region or a different region, all of them can utilize the same architecture. So you are not limited right now by any kind of native constructs limitations that you cannot connect multiple TGWs together in the same region, or you cannot have more than five native constructs in the same region. So if you have hundreds of BUs, there is no problem with this architecture because it is repeatable by itself. So, one thing is, okay, I do have a control. Business unit one has a control on its application. It has control on the firewall rules and everything. But at the same time, he does not want to remain isolated over here. The business unit wants to communicate with the rest of the world, maybe some other business units. Maybe it wants to communicate with the on-prem world. At that point, what you have to do, you have to connect the, all these transits together. This is a high-speed multi region transit, which we are talking about over here, right? Okay, so from the, let me give you an example of a cloud service provider like GCP. When GCP takes a look at this picture, GCP says, hey, why do you even need a transit? Because we are providing you a global VPC. So all your application would reside in only a single VPC because everybody plays with their own strengths. That is GCP's strength. But actually, I mean, I have not seen any enterprise which build their architecture a flat architecture. Enterprises needs governance, they need hierarchy. And this architecture, which we are talking about over here, it provides all that, including the repeatability. You can repeat the same architecture over and over in the same region. You can go into multiple region, and then, I mean, if you wanted to do the same thing in the multi-cloud environment too, then definitely you can do this thing in the multi-cloud environment as well. So now moving on to the networking piece. So let's focus on this dotted line over here. So what are the different things Aviatrix platform can provide you when it comes to the networking? So the first big problem with the native construct is the route table management, right? How are you going to manage the routes? Day one is one thing which you can do it using the uh, Terraforms and some other infrastructure as a code. But what about day two, when you are going to manage this thing for the next five to 10 years? At that point, what are you going to do at that point, right? It becomes really, really difficult. So Aviatrix helps over there. It provides you the automation of all those route table management, not only in the VPC, but also in the transit as well. Okay, so now you have set up your entire transit environment. So your VPCs, your applications and communicate with each other across the regions, across the VPCs through the transit. But these applications has to be available from the on-prem world too. The on-prem could be your data center. 
The on-prem could be your partners who wants to gain access to those applications. It could be the IoT devices. Anything could be on the on-prem. So this on-prem connectivity has to be provided using a common protocol, which is industry standard is a BGP protocol. Providing this BGP functionality is, uh, is basically not a big deal. The, the important and the most critical thing is how are you providing this functionality, right? So you have to provide the BGP functionality along with all the knobs. So customers, enterprises have full control in there. Now, if a partner tries to join your environment, tries to connect to your environment and sends a default route, like a quad zero route, it's not going to bring down your entire network. So you have a control using the BGP route approvals and stuff. Unless you approve a route, the Aviatrix controller is not going to send this route across all the VPCs. So that's the power which Aviatrix platform is bringing in. Also, for those of you who has been working in the data center world, like on-prem world for quite a while, you guys know how, how important it is to have the route filtering capability over here, the BGP knobs availability, so you can control, you can do all the traffic engineering in there, right? This is very, very critical. Another important piece regarding the cloud networking is the overlapping IP. How many times we run into this issue that there is an application which has the same IP because the developer went into the cloud first and there is no way for the developer to change the IP. And by the way, the on-prem is also using the same IP. How are you going to provide that kind of support? That kind of support is not available in any cloud services provider, native constructs, right? So this is not only going to provide you that kind of functionality, but for all those other use cases like Kubernetes kind of use cases. So the overlapping IP support is available in the architecture. So now on, let me move on to the next, uh, the next functionality. And the next functionality is very critical because one thing is to provide the infrastructure. The second important thing is how are you providing that infrastructure and that in infrastructure has to be secure enough, like all the way from on-prem over to the cloud. Because you are in the cloud, it means you are trusting the cloud, but there is a medium which is connecting you from on-prem over to the cloud that medium has to be protected. That medium has to be inspected, not only inspected, but also encrypted all the way up to your application. And this is what Aviatrix is providing over here in the security, right? So you have the end-to-end -end encryption, and it doesn't matter whether you are using the Azure Express route or, or a direct connect, like which is an AWS private link. So, like a line rate of encryption is available for all the way from on-prem over to the VPCs level. Important thing these days is uh, the segmentation, right? You wanted to make sure your network traffic is always segmented, right? So over here, what I'm showing you, like different colors of the VPCs, like green VPCs and then the blue VPCs. Here, if you are in a green VPC, doesn't matter, whether you are in the same region or in multi-region environment. If you belong to a green VPC, then you will have a default communication with anybody across the region or in your own region. But if you are in two different domains or segments, then by default, you are not allowed to communicate with each other. But there are times when you wanted to make sure that this green VPC and the blue VPCs would communicate with each other. What would be that time? The time when you wanted to make sure your three tier app, which has the app uh, tier and then the web tier. So the whenever web tier wants to communicate with the app tier, that traffic has to go through the firewalls first, right? And that's exactly what Aviatrix is providing. At that point, all you have to do is to connect these together. And that connection is called a connection policy. So that control you have in your hand now. So what you can do, you can create this connection and the traffic whenever is destined or sourced to between these VPCs will always go through the firewall. And by the way, the instantiation of these firewalls, the automation, 
the deployment, also the, the redirection of the traffic to these firewalls are all done by Aviatrix controller. You can choose any firewalls of your choice. Maybe you like uh, Checkpoint better than the Palo Alto or Fortinet. So all options are available for you. Some more security functionality, which are getting more and more famous these days. For example, the private SaaS. Like how many times we heard that, like, hey, I wanted to access my S3 bucket or maybe the Workday or maybe the Salesforce.com. I wanted to access this, but I don't want to access this using the internet. I wanted to access it through the direct connect or express route. Is there any way I, I can access this using the least amount of latency by utilizing my direct connect or express route? But at the same time, I don't want my users who will access their private S3s using the same direct connect because of the cost concerns, because of the, because of the security concerns. Then the answer to that question is yes, Aviatrix platform has built-in capability of that as well. So now I want you to focus on this particular VPC right here, which I'm hovering my mouse here. The, there is no firewall because this business unit does not want to manage any of the firewalls for any reasons. Maybe the cost is the reason, or maybe he does not has the capability. Maybe the engineering is not there. Then what he wants to do, he still wants to secure his environment. The way you can do it, that every Aviatrix gateway has a built-in layer for a stateful firewall. So you can utilize that functionality also. Now, the, again, since we are talking about the security, another important piece of the security is the applications who are sitting in your wall gardens like VPC or VNATs. They wanted to have the communication to the outside world. Why? Because either you may be a web server or maybe you want to download some patches. Maybe you want to communicate with the Git. But most of the time, the application mapping is missing from the application team. Maybe they inherit the application and the developer is already long gone. At that point, what you end up doing, you end up opening up the application to the rest of the world, like, you know, blank check. So basically what it means, you're not only jeopardizing only one application, but also the entire cloud environment at that point. For those kind of use cases, we do have a service or functionality, which is called secure egress. Now you can actually take a look at the, what kind of traffic patterns are there. And based on the traffic patterns, you are going to write those specific rules in, in the Aviatrix gateways. Okay. Now let's move on to the cloud access. Like cloud access is something when you are connecting your on-prem world. On-prem world could be your branches, your data center, maybe your employees are connecting using the user VPN, especially times like these where everybody is working from home. How many times you have to actually provide access to your partners, your contractors and employees who are now the remote workers. But you wanted to make sure at the same time that the partner should not interfere or should not poke around into the resources of the contractor or the employee. Contractor will just go and utilize or use his own resources, nothing else. But employee should go and then access wherever or whatever the admin has allowed him. At the same time, for the SD-WAN, the enterprises have invested heavily in the SD-WAN world too. They have these you know, segments created and the traffic is all the way segmented up to the cloud. We are going to provide you the connectivity all the way to the transit and keeping the segmentation all the way to the transit layer, right? Providing the connectivity through the, um, through the IPsec is one thing, but providing it efficiently, automating everything, and then providing you a, some kind of a script which you can just upload, that is something which is very, very critical and important for the enterprises, which you can actually manage from the same single pane of glass. Another important aspect of this cloud access is something which we call it a cloud WAN. That's Aviatrix offering. What cloud WAN does, as most of us know, that 
Cisco is predominant when it comes to the, the branches access, providing the branch access, right? Millions of like about 10 millions of uh, Cisco ISRs are present in a lot of branches worldwide. And this is one of the big challenges from the enterprises that how to manage all those millions of uh, the ISR routers over there. So CloudWan, Aviatrix CloudWan, what it provides, it provides you the, the connectivity to the cloud, the automated connectivity basically. So you don't even have to create or configure anything on the ISR side. Everything is done through the Aviatrix controller and you can manage everything remotely from Again, same controller. So what are we doing at the back end? We are utilizing the AWS, like Global Accelerator, the um, Azure, CloudFront, all those native technologies, and we are providing the least amount of latency when you are connecting these services. All right, so from the cloud network operation, so what I've talked about so far, I mean, we were just focusing mainly on the day zero and day one functionality. But again, as I said previously as well, that's something which is going to live with you for the next five to 10 years minimum is you have to actually operationalize as well. So if you cannot operationalize it, then it becomes a big challenge. The tools which you used to use in your on-prem world, like the pings, the trace routes, the packet captures, the full visibility if something happens, you really don't want to be blindsided if something happens. Because if you don't have control, if you don't have a visibility, then all your certifications of CCI, double CCI, triple CCI, Azure Architect, AWS Architect, that's all going to go away if you cannot see what is going on in there. So these Aviatrix Copilot, as I described previously, and Aviatrix Flight Path is going to provide you all those functionality, including the packet captures as well. So one of my customer is uh, actually utilizing around 4,000 accounts spread across multi-cloud environment. Just imagine how difficult it is for him to manage 4,000 accounts. Yes, he's a service provider, but managing 4,000 accounts is not a joke. So Aviatrix platform is actually providing that kind of functionality as well that you can onboard all your accounts on a, on a same controller. All right, so a lot of things, I mean, I talked about it regarding the Aviatrix. So we are also doing a lot of stuff in terms of the native constructs as well, because we understand their language. We are multilingual, right? We don't only speak the Aviatrix, we also speak all the cloud native constructs as language as well. So let me give you an example. For example, Guard Duty. What is this service? This is nothing but an IDS. IDS, which provides you the malicious IP information. What are you going to do with that? You are just going to take a look at it and you cannot take any action. So Aviatrix actually, what, what Aviatrix is doing, it's putting these native constructs on steroids. So we are taking the same information which Cloud Guard, which Guard Duty is providing, and then we are actually creating policy on our gateways and then creating the policy like that, that these malicious IP, access to these malicious IPs are not allowed. So this IDS become the IPS now. So we are giving meaning to these cloud native constructs basically. All right. So so, uh, so this, this uh, one thing that, you know, I want to highlight here, right? So okay. basically from an enterprise perspective, right? This, this uh, control plane, which is intelligent in nature, uh, provides you the not only the control and management plane, but also the uh, traffic engineering capabilities, network correctness, all of this, you know, basically is ensuring that the enterprise IT has control and they get empowered to manage and uh, keep up to the SLAs that they are signing up for. So it's uh, empowering the enterprise IT, ensuring that they are successful into uh, the CSP environment. And also obviously it's a win-win for CSP as well, because the more easier it gets, the more uh, enterprise grade it gets, the more they expand. Yeah, well, very well said, Noman. So let's let me show you guys the same diagram which we which actually Noman showed previously, right? So now the same diagram, same architecture, which was true for single cloud. 
exactly the same diagram, same architecture is true for multi-cloud environment as well. You can see, you don't have to do anything else. Same thing which you created for AWS, you have to do the same thing for Azure and GCP. So basically what we are saying that you have to learn only one language, right? And then Aviatrix is going to do all the translation for you, right? So now let me uh, move on to the Aviatrix platform capability when it comes to the multi-cloud environment. Again, same capabilities which I talked about in the previous couple of slides. If you are in multiple cloud, you really don't have to do anything else. Exactly the same thing. All you have to do is to just repeat it. Okay, so uh, let's move on to the transit comparison, right? So one of the things which I really want to talk about is, is the, the importance of the transit. As we have seen in the last couple of slides, the most critical part of any architecture is the transit because that's the area where you are connecting multiple VPCs to have a communication with each other. You are connecting multiple regions. You are connecting multiple clouds. You're also connecting your hybrid environment. So this becomes your spinal cord. If transit is done right, then your whole architecture is going to be strong. If it's not, then there is a problem and you might have to do a, a redesign, a massive redesign in the future. So, here, um, I just wanted to just point out over here a couple of things, right? For example, there's a uh, hundred BGP route limitations, and then for the Azure, there's like you know four hundred routes limitations over here. These limitations are there, and the reason why because these cloud service providers have an you know unfair advantage of owning the entire infrastructure. When they're owning the infrastructure, they can do whatever they want. They can bring in any new feature at any time, right? So that's the capability, that's the power they have. But at the same time, they have to provide the scale. So a lot of their customers, like thousands and thousands of their customers, they cannot provide the same scale which enterprise is looking for. And that's where we are making these native construct looks much better, much better here. So all these limitations which you see with Aviatrix, these limitations are, are gone. So there are no scalability concerns with the Aviatrix. Some of the concerns related to the intra-region, right? In intra-region, you cannot connect multiple TGWs together, right? You cannot have more than five TGWs in a region. All those limitations are not there. Again, when you are taking your journey from one cloud to another cloud, just trust us in this regard, right? Because right now you may be in a single cloud and you're really, really happy with whatever you have built. But this is not a technical decision anymore. The business, it's a business decision, decision where anytime the business says, no, I have to go in a different cloud and very specific to one single cloud, how are you going to do that? These native cloud constructs, is, they don't even have any incentive to provide you a, a, some kind of construct which can connect you to multiple cloud. That, there is no incentive for them and they will never do this thing, right? Again, from the security perspective, we talked about it a lot, right? And you can see over here, none of the cloud service provider can provide you the high performance encryption in there, right? So all those connectivity is by default insecure, unencrypted in nature. From the operational perspective, you wanted to make sure you have a full control of your environment. You can see all your multi-region, single cloud, or maybe multi-region, multi-cloud environment from the same controller. All right, so this is, this is all good, but after looking at so many different things, one can think, hey, by the way, this all looks good, but it looks pretty complicated, right? And then why don't, uh, like, you know, you tell me, if I am going to start my journey with the Aviatrix, then um, this might take months for me, if not years. But in reality, actually, that's not true, right? By the way, th these are a few of those uh, features comparison, which we did, if you wanted to have the full, uh, a full comparison, then you can log on to the community.aviatrix.com and you have all the information over there. 
So now with this, you can actually deploy everything in an afternoon. So if you have a, like a, an Azure customer or that's your primary cloud or maybe AWS is your primary cloud, all you have to do is to log into that marketplace and then find a VAPREX controller and then just deploy it. It's not gonna take more than 15 minutes to deploy this. From the AVX controller, the gateways and everything will be in will be deployed directly from the AVX controller. So you ha don't have to look for anything else in the marketplace. And if you wanted to create an architecture like this, which I'm showing you, it's going to take anywhere between 90 to 120 minutes. You know, give or take like two hours to just create an architecture for 10 VPCs or 10 VNets. Again, everything is automated through the Aviatrix controller. The controller, the gateways, the transit architecture, all good, but you have to make sure your environment is also secure. So you wanted to make sure that there is a firewall inspection available. Again, when you do something like this from controller, it's going to take another 60 to 90 minutes. Now you have your environment ready for 10 VPCs or 10 VNets across multiple regions with the firewall ready to get everything inspected. Everything is done, including the on-prem connectivity, which will take another five minutes or so. So altogether, we are talking about somewhere around three to four hours if you are doing everything from the controller UI. But if you want to get everything done through the Aviatrix Terraform, then that would reduce this time to another couple of hours. So in total, if you are looking for an architecture from let's say five VPCs or five VNets with the firewalls and everything, then we are looking somewhere around $1,000 per month for five VPCs, including the FireNet and everything. And if you're looking for any kind of um, guided tours, anything like, hey, we need some architectural discussion with you, please contact us at info at aviatrix.com. We will be glad to help you out with that. So Saad, one, one thing I want to add here, right? So uh, another beauty of uh, go, going with the cloud, uh, uh, public cloud, right, is whether you are a hundred employee uh, enterprise or a hundred thousand employee enterprise, right? You can, you, sh you don't have to compromise on an architecture. Right? because you're not paying for capex you're not paying for opex you're not investing in the hardware csp is providing you on a pay as you go model right so you can put together an architecture uh, which is uh, highly available manageable secure high performance and you can start small and then you can continue to expand as your business grows this is a beauty of uh, being in cloud provider that you know no need to worry about uh, expensive uh, you know hardware or, or architectures a company or enterprise of any size can start the journey in the right way and be able to expand as they go forward and consume. Yeah, great point, Naman. All right, with that, I'm going to hand, over, hand it over back to Rod. Hey everyone, thanks a lot for joining the webinar today. We have a quick uh, poll here. We'd uh, appreciate it if you could answer that. Uh, and also I just wanted to highlight that special for everybody that joined today, uh, we actually have ACE training, now self-service uh, ACE training, self-paced that you can do. It typically costs $895 and we're giving you a code that would allow you to get into that free. That code is TECHTALKS30, all capitals, TECHTALKS30. So you can uh, do that. We put it into the chat window here so you can pick that up. Also highlight that uh, if you have any questions, I know there was a lot of detail today. If you want to drill in, have uh, us look at your architecture, give you some examples of reference architectures that could apply in your environment, please reach out to us at info at aviatrix.com. And also you can see we've got a couple more Tech Talk Tuesdays coming up here are the next two in June please register and join us and we'll go into those kinds of more details. Rob, a quick question yep. for you. Sure. Is the uh, exam washer also included with the code which you just mentioned? Uh, I, I believe it is, yes. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, thank you everyone for joining today. Thanks.